going to do her uh, her beginning. And we have Brooke here. Uh, Brooke Weiss is the chair of um, Moms for Liberty, a fantastic group out of Charlotte. And we're going to be talking to her a little bit about uh, the situation going on in Charlotte with respect to critical race theory in our schools. But first, I want to open it up. I um, hope you guys had a great weekend. We had a very lively weekend around here. Um, Education First Alliance this weekend reported that um, last Thursday, I believe it was, in Orange County, our superintendent of schools, Catherine Truitt, had a moment where I think she's being quite honest and, and exasperated that um, that her thought was that Bill 324 uh, that's coming through the Senate right now, that's a bill to stop, uh, not critical race theory, but to stop discrimination, to stop racial incitement in the schools. That particular bill, she thought was kind of stalled out in the Senate. And it could possibly be because the Senate is worried about what Apple and what Google will say about passing what is essentially the a restatement of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Who would have thunk it? So it appears uh, to a lot of us right now that Apple and Google and Amazon, who have just newly moved into North Carolina, are controlling uh, both political parties, probably making it a single party state and certainly has a large amount to do with North Carolina's education system. Now, we know that Apple has given Wake County schools a reported $100 million, right? So they're already a massive player in our education system. But to think that they might have influence over this critical race theory bill is concerning for a lot of us. Now, we're going to break down what goes in or what's going into that critical race theory bill. But Brooke, since I have you, I want to talk to you. I want to show you first um, a schematic that is being given to all teachers in your district. This is all CMS teachers um, need to not only, um, and by the way, they're giving this schematic, you guys, right before they have to sign a racial confessional. And they have to uh, to sign a reported race confessional that says they are a white supremacist and they will repent and redeem themselves. But let me show you the schematic they're given um, before they do that so we can all have a centering document here. Okay, can you guys see this? So I want to see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. But but this is what, what teachers are being given, Brooke and Charlotte. We're working with, in fact, our coalition, we've got about 30% of our coalition that, as we talked about before we came on, that are teachers who are afraid to speak up. They're from all over North Carolina. They don't want to be hassled. They want to keep their job. They love to teach, right? But what they don't like is being trained to be anti-racist educators. Now, we all agree that racism of any sort, period, has no place in the classroom. Hate has no place in the classroom. But unfortunately, critical race theory is making it so teachers learn how to stereotype children, how to scapegoat them, how to shame them, and really how to shut them up, how to censor them. This is an anti-intellectual program that's going into the school. So I'll just, if you can't see this, let me point this out. Um, this one arrow, these are the arrows that I find kind of outrageous. Um, I will yield positions of power to those otherwise marginalized. So what you're telling teachers is to give up their power. Now, for a black teacher who has paid their dues, gone to school, educated themselves, worked very hard. Maybe they've been doing this for 10 years. This right here means that a black American teacher will have to give up her power to um, an immigrant who may be here on a green card or may be here illegally or what have you. No American, white, black or otherwise, no one should have to subjugate themselves um, to another, right? We're, we're all equal here. So that's one thing I picked up, Brooke, because this is going on in your schools. Um, another thing is, is that um, I sit with my discomfort. Well, if you're giving a teacher training that tells teacher that they will sit with their discomfort, uh, that means that they can sit with discomfort of being racially discriminated against or sexually discriminated against or abused in any way. I mean, in this country, when we have a civil rights issue or an issue of any sort, we need to use our voice. We need to empower each other. This is actually telling teachers to shut the hell up. Um, I think that's objectionable. Another one is I um, I identify how I unknowingly benefit from racism. So remember, this is a schematic and, a, and an exercise drill that's given to all teachers. So can you imagine telling a Jewish teacher, I benefit from racism? Uh, or a black teacher, I benefit from racism. Racism is an evil. 
it has no benefit. It has no benefit. And the last one is um, I pledge that I'll surround myself with others who think and look differently from me. Um, well, I think most of us do that already in the course of our lives. But even if you don't, why are we telling teachers who they can and cannot associate with in their lives beyond the schoolroom? I mean, this is part of critical race theory that I find extremely objectionable. We've been talking about it for a long time. That's why we've been articulating for the ideals embodied in House Bill 324. Brooke, you're in Charlotte. What are teachers telling you? So they're scared. I have some CMS teachers that are members of Moms for Liberty, Mecklenburg's chapter, and they're straight up scared. Um, you know, CMS is not calling it critical race theory. Um, they have this whole, you know, new speak language right out of 1984. You know, they're, they're redefining words. So they're not calling it critical race theory, but it is here. And every single one of our school board members, with the exception of Sean Strain, um, is pushing this. And teachers are scared. The truth is, teachers have already given up enough power. OK, I am a certified middle school science mm -hmm. teacher. It's hard enough to teach before critical race came along, all right? The truth is most of us spend the majority of our time managing behavior. We don't even get to teach in the first place. So no teacher, I don't care what color they are, doesn't need to be given up any more of their power. And that schematic to me was horrifying. I don't know how many CMS teachers have seen that yet, but basically you got to figure out which one of those little bubbles you're in and then work your way out to being an anti-racist, which is nothing more than a racist, okay? Critical race theory uh, is racism. It, it places minorities in a perpetual state of victimhood and nobody benefits from being placed, you know, in a, in a state of victimhood and to place a person for CRT to place a person in their oppressed or oppressor category. Uh, it, it only looks at their skin color. That's it. It doesn't look at anything else. Uh, it, you know, it's CRT is nothing more than Marxism reframed. Marxism, uh, classic Marxism didn't work in the United States because you couldn't pit classes against each other. So critical race theory is nothing more than a reframing of, of Marxism and it, it pits races against each other. So, right. well, you know, that's absolutely true. And then we're racking our brains, you know, why are people objecting to 324 or why is it languishing? Um, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, this, this is. That the teachers are being presented the goal here is to become anti-racist so you look at these you know three different shaded bubbles and you figure out which one you fit into and then i'm sure the training that they're gonna you know the the professional development that every teacher has to do before the beginning of a school year this year it's going to be this figure out which bubble you're in and then we're going to get you to the growth zone well, that's what it is. And it's really about control. So these four things are controlling white teachers, black teachers, getting them to relinquish their power. And that's really what it's all about. I mean, this is nothing um, but a power grab. And so, Nancy, what's interesting, Nancy, your research and what you've been working on is that this concept of critical race theory, Inc., uh, this House Bill 324, one of the key things that it will do is make sure that people like James Ford, and others who are associated now with school boards and the legislature, actually, they will not be able to make money off of teaching this crap that we just saw. And so, Nancy, you're calling it CRT Inc. Tell us a little bit about what you found. Um, what I particularly like in the bill is that it goes beyond um, just some basic civil rights in the classroom, but also applies it to people who contract with these schools. So all of these equity institutes, all of these race consultants, um, if they're proposing uh, the same type of message where you have oppressors and um, systemic racism and all that, they they cannot operate within the public school system. This is my understanding of the reading of the bill. And I remember when I listened back when it was first debated on the House floor um, and it was Representative Gailiard from Rocky Mount, um, who, one of the people who argued against it. 
he specifically called it an anti-business bill. And um, <laughs> it's because these people are making money off of this stuff. I don't know what exactly it's producing. It's not really producing a service. There's no product here. It's just a political um, messaging type ideology um, that we end up paying for as taxpayers um, and wasting, and not just paying for directly for paying these companies, but also paying for um, time off for these teachers to go do these trainings. So for example, one huge one out of Greensboro that's become bigger and bigger is Racial Equity Institute. <clears throat> and this is the stuff they tweet out. Um, so this bill would prevent them potentially from working with the schools because they're based in this type of ideology, which I think is great. And I think is part of the reason why there's so much uproar, you know, especially from those within the industry, because we know DEI has gotten to be an $8 billion industry against this bill. They're very scared. This is going to um, take a market away from them. This is not a free market. This is a market defined by legislators and school boards making these policies to implement these trainings and then using tax dollars to pay these trainers who are often related to the school boards and related to the legislators. Um, and then they say, well, there's a demand for this stuff. Well, I argue that there isn't really a demand, that it's a manufactured demand. Um, and this is a prime example. RAI is several places. And not only that, but they network. So they all retweet each other. They all support each other. You can find the whole network. Um, REI, there's OR organizing against racism. There's um, we are uh, working to extend anti-racism uh, and they're all supported by James Ford of the school board who has his own with Creed and they all support and they all network and they all have links to school boards, local school boards at the state level. Um, and so this is why I think this bill is, is so huge, not just for protecting students and teachers in the classroom, but this is an anti-business bill, I suppose, but it's an anti-snake oil business bill is how I like to describe it. Right, I mean, this, this is right here. This is one of the um, equity training companies right yeah. here for We Are. I mean- We Are, and this is, uh, yeah, they do, um, they've done work in several public school systems and in private schools. Um, the founder of this is married to the equity officer of Durham County Public Schools. And this is what he's saying. <laughs> so it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, do you want do you want this kind of hate in the classroom? No, we don't. No, and this the person who founded this one. She's a she's a specialist. She has a PhD from um, UNC, and she's a specialist uh, in whiteness and white children's racial identities. What? Um, yeah. So, and that's was on a public page. Um, and she's a specialist in in critical race theory. She says she's a CRT. Um, specialist who studies whiteness and white children's um, racial identities. And she's been in several public school systems, is friends with board members. Board members' kids have gone to her trainings and summer camps. James Ford retweets her, publicizes her. REI does. Um, she retweets them. She retweets uh, James Ford. They're all this network and they're all interconnected. And they have either friends in the public school system on boards or even spouses. Her spouse is in the Durham public school system. Right, and so this is one big um, group thing. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. I mean, you know, someone gets in the office and they're gonna hire uh, friends of friends and, and friends in the equity business and all that. And really, I mean, you know, we did some reporting uh, a month or so ago and it seems like Charlotte, uh, CMS is paying $500,000 a year for this equity training crap instead of uh, worrying about learning loss and how to recover learning loss and how to teach STEM better and, and employing pedagogies with a proven track record to actually work. Now, listen, guys, critical race theory is illegal in France and in the UK. Why? A, it makes children dumb. B, it divides children. And C, it creates violence. It creates racial violence. That is something that we don't want, we don't need, we don't want for any children. That's what's going on. And so in Charlotte, I mean, so you guys are organizing uh, this. I know that your school boards are still meeting virtually. Is that right, Brooke? Yes. And I actually had interaction with them today because I went ahead and requested my two virtual minutes for the um July 13th meeting and I, I, I added, you know, when are you guys going to be in person? 
One of them responded and said that it's not up to them, it's up to the city council. So after I finish this call, I will be sending an action item out to everybody in Miles for Liberty and we're gonna blast the city council because it's ridiculous. Okay. And if the next meeting is still virtual, we will be organizing a protest outside of the school board meeting uh, because these meetings, it, it, it benefits them to have them virtually because they can shut me up very easily. Right. After two minutes, they just turn my camera yeah. off. Yeah. Listen, I wanted to respond to a couple of things that y'all said. Um, half, more than half of CMS students failed their end of year exams in the fall, okay? More than half. So that $500,000 that they're spending on this BS racist training for the teachers, that $500,000 should be going towards remediation and helping all of these students that were forced into a year and a half of mm -hmm. virtual learning and have you know, fallen who knows how far backwards. That's why we, where we need to be spending that $500,000. I also wanna mention somebody in the comments said that um, you know, their district swears that they're not doing critical race theory, instead they're doing culturally responsive teaching. This is, this is just a, a, an, an example of newspeak, okay? They're not calling it critical race theory because if you do, then everybody in America is up in arms about critical race theory and doesn't want it. Culturally responsive teaching is exactly the same thing. The truth is we send our kids to school to learn math, science, read, you know, his, the core subjects. Why are we talking about skin color? Right. It doesn't belong in school. Well, we have a literacy crisis <laughs> in this state for sure. In this country, most definitely. I'm putting up here a, um, whoopsie, I must have lost it. I'm sorry about that. I want to get that out. We have a literacy crisis. And this is really, it's a, it's a very cruel smoke screen here to to cover for that i'll get this up in a second but i mean you know the reading scores i'm looking at it not only the reading scores but the math scores as well um they've gone down since i mean i think it was like 2011 north carolina was the 19th in the country for schools now it's the 38th ranking so the reading and math for all colors of children has gone like this boom down and so you know, we know by the way, you know, someone asked me today, hey, if we don't do critically race, critical race rate, what can be a replacement for that, right? What can we replace it with? We want to have a good alternative. Well, Science guess what? <laughs> that's Start teaching yeah. kids how to read. Well, you know, that's the issue here is that is that the, this is taking up valuable instructional time for STEM, which we need so badly for reading and quite honestly, creative thinking. Mm -hmm. This is a program of censorship. So House Bill 324, I mean, you know, it provides really when, in my reading that we stop focusing on race and we start focusing on teaching. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't been here since 2011. So I, I, I believe that math and reading scores have probably gone down. Uh, research is coming out now because laptops have been in classrooms long enough now. Uh, we, we gave kids laptops because we thought that that would help them. The, Data is showing us now, you know, science, real science is showing us now that giving the children laptops has not helped them. It has, in fact, hurt them. Their math and uh, reading scores have gone down since we've given them laptops. We need to get real books, okay? We need to get, we need to get books like this back in their hands. That's what we need to do. Forget the laptops. Forget cultural race theory whatever you want to call it and just start teaching these kids how to read and add and subtract right and brooke i want to put this up this matrix of oppression so this is another thing that is being given to all teachers in the district in charlotte and beyond but we can verify charlotte so teachers uh be it black white whoever are having to identify themselves on this matrix of oppression so you're either over here where you're privileged and over here, you're either he refuse to do it. You're either a target or refuse to do it. Pardon me? What happens to the teachers if they refuse to take part? I'm so it? glad that you asked that. I'm so glad that you asked that. First of all, these trainings are mandatory, number one. And number two, we're having uh, a more than a couple of teachers tell us that once they do fill this out, that teachers start acting on it. Have you seen or heard or read anything about that study? 
um, the prisoner and guard study. It was they took, you know, 25 or 30 wonderful students. I mean, good people, but they labeled half of them essentially oppressors and half of them the oppressed. And they had to stop the study within, I think, 48 hours because those who um, felt targeted, right, and powerful, um, they came after the other half. They had to stop the study. That is exactly what's going on with the teachers in the school. And I want you to know, children, this is what's happening with children inside of the schools. We're hearing from uh, black parents, white parents, biracial parents, uh, Mexican parents. We are hearing from everyone that these sort of things, these sort of things have happened to them. Um, and so this is what um, people want to know what critical race theory is. It's not just a theory, a dead book of words. It's actions. It's actions that stereotype, that scapegoat, that shame, that collectively punishment to, to punish. That's what it is. That's what it does. Let me understand this. If I identify myself on this on this chart, I'm white, so I'm privileged. Um, well, I don't even have one of these on here for sex because I'm just a woman. Oh, I guess I'm a biological woman. I mean, I, I don't I don't understand why I would refuse to do that. I'm not right. going to put any of those labels on myself. Yeah, and that's the real question is, is there's, no, you know, there's no benefit in that other than to discriminate against people. That's the only reason. I don't care whether you're a teacher, whether you're a student, whether you're a principal, whether you're on a school board, whether you're Catherine Truitt. I don't care who you are. Putting those labels on people to purpose is to discriminate, period. Well, now that we're getting um, now that we're getting uh, to talking about what's going on at the DPI. So these teacher trainings are happening at the DPI level. There is we've had an action item, and that is to eliminate the ISKME contract. We've been talking a lot about that. ISKME was a, a company or it's a, a nonprofit out of Silicon Valley that the DPI long before um, this current administration got in at the DPI. Um, they were doing culturally responsive teaching. We have it on our website. We have all the tapes. We set the training it is critical race theory and the things I just showed you. And so we've been calling for no renewal of that contract. Catherine Trudeau wants three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars of taxpayer money to renew that contract. Now, let me tell you, Brooke, you were just talking about this. This is a platform. It's called OER. Everybody OER. Look it up. OER. And it was developed in concert with the U.N., so it's a UNESCO or a global product, um, this OER. It's called ISK means OER. But what it does, you guys, it's an open platform that teachers can, and they do, and this training that the DPI gave them, censor all of your books, all of your material. It's not textbooks. It's a complete bastardization of Western canon. And they can do make all these fixes and changes, put critical race theory every, everywhere, put it behind a locked password so only certain teachers can get it, right? So well-meaning school boards, well-meaning principals, well-meaning supervisors and superintendents cannot see what's going on. Parents cannot see what's going on. It's an open platform. Now, the name is open platform. So we've been told by Jimmy Falkenberry, who actually works for Catherine Truitt and represents her, that this is a closed platform and that the DPI edits everything that's on there. That flies in the face of what Catherine Truitt said the next day and the name of it. Look, it's an open platform. It's run by UNESCO. Um, is part of this, and it's pumping in uh, globalist propaganda into the classroom. This is important. In through country boundaries, through state boundaries, through district boundaries, and through school boundaries. That's what it's used for. We've heard from teachers in Charlotte that math, all the math now, is going to be on this platform. Can you imagine? So no books, no nothing that you can check on. It's it's They're doing that on purpose. It's safe like me when i found out what happened in my daughter's english classroom yeah. i started demanding to see the curriculum i fought for a month just to get inside audrey kell high school to see the test that was administered to my daughter exactly. that you know I, as a parent calling and say hey i want to see the test y'all gave my daughter that it would i'd be in it the next day i had to fight for a month in order and threatened with a lawsuit in order to get inside there and see that's why they're doing, they don't want parents to see the curriculum yeah this will be gone and so this is flies in the face of uh sb 755 which is for transparency nancy tell us what you know about that bill and about what the isk me contract 
can do for that to 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 thwart transparency. Well, my understanding of that bill is that the teachers have to put the um, materials that they taught for the past year, I believe, um, online in anticipation of the next year. So at least parents can see what's been taught. Um, you know, there's some weakness in that because I'd prefer, I think most people would prefer that it's um, proactive and that they do more proactive work and being transparent and putting the stuff up, you know, a week ahead of time or whatever, two weeks ahead of time. So you have an idea of not just what's on there, but your child's homework schedule and can be more involved in terms of um, what's going on there. And I think being, I think the issue with being transparent, so I think it's a good start, you know, um, I think it could be uh, probably better, but, um, you know, my understanding is with, for example, the comprehensive sex ed stuff for the sex ed stuff in North Carolina schools, you have to go in person to see it and you can only go at certain times. And so working parents have trouble going there. And there's a question about, I can't remember whether you can take pictures or not. And, you yeah. know, it's not the, it's not the easiest, right. It's not the easiest access to do. And it's kind of ironic to me in that, you know, they advocate all of this technology in schools and these open platforms and sharing and, and all of this. And, but then all of a sudden it's like, well, it's too much work to be transparent. Well, <laughs> and it's, yeah. well you're, you're advocating all this technology. It's not that hard to throw it up there, you know, and plus your plans and it, yeah, okay, if something unexpected comes yeah. up, some current event or something that you feel like you've broke, then send an email out to parents saying, you know, this happened and the kids want to talk about it next week, so I'm going to be using this material. And you know, sure. the copyright material you can get around because you can just say the name of the material and the parent can go look it up or invest in buying it themselves or whatever. And so, um, yeah, I find this whole uh, transparency um, argument against it kind of la laughable. I don't think it will add significantly to the workload unless there's some huge bureaucracy in place. I think it would um, engage more parents because they can go and see, okay, my kid's doing this this week and they're having a test on this and um, I can be involved and, ooh, I can supplement, oh, this relates to something in our family. Maybe I can supplement, you know, something with it or ask the teacher about this. and. I think it would bring people together. Um, so um, yeah, I'm I'm for that. And I think it's ironic that they wanna push these programs like ISKME um, and these open platforms, but then say, uh, you know, well, we can't really be transparent. <laughs> well, yeah, I just wanna get this out there. All, all is, is being done in the name of equity and in the name of um, a lot of it is that the school is, the schools are based on white supremacy. I mean, that was, um, that's just the foundational reason. And look, if we accept that as the thesis, right? Let's just say that we're true. Then why in the hell would you want things uh, behind closed doors? Why wouldn't you want openness? If this is a supposed uh, white supremacy school structure, why right. in the hell can we not have more open open stuff and not less? Yeah, that's that makes total sense too. And if so, it is, I mean, my argument too is even if they argue systemic racism and this country's laws are inherently um, based on racist um, ideals, then why do you want more government? Why do you want more bureaucracy? Why do you want offices of equity? Why do you want, um, you know, offices of systemic race, whatever Kendi suggested, like that's gonna add, if your theory is that the government as it stands now is systemically racist and these laws are built on racism and racist structures, and you wanna add to it, that makes no sense. You wanna have all these extra offices and everything, you'd wanna, you'd want to break down some of the bureaucracies and some of the barriers to allow access to more people. Yeah, you do, you do. And so what we wanted to to bring out to you is a couple of things. We have, and that's why we're on twice a week, every week, we have a fire hose coming at us. It's coming from the federal level. It's coming from the state level. And you know this very well, Brooke, it's coming from the district level. We have to work all of it. And what we've all been good at doing is working together and that you guys at the district level um, can work with us and we can tell you from the state level what will and will work and kind of communicate with each other in that way. And so, look, what we need to do is this. We need to, first of all, call your representatives, call your senators, um, tell them you absolutely want, you know, you want to get some action um, on this legislation 324. Let them know what's in it. Again, all it is is a recitation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I'll try to get it up there in a second. Um, but another thing is, is that, look, we're all into educating the public, right? And so educating the public is a job. I know that you guys want action items, and we've given you many action items, and I'm going to pop a few in the chat. But we are in an information war, and that means if you look to your right and you look to your left, chances are 
uh, only one person is going to know what the heck critical race theory is. It's important that we get everybody knowing it. And so people that ask us all the time, well, well what are our action points? Share this information. Number one, I'm going to give you a, a critical race theory primer right here. And uh, I want you to pass it along to your reps. Sometimes they don't know what's going on. Have you found that with some of your school board members or some people in the legislators? What is, what is mom's literally confused? Yeah. They're completely confused and they don't understand what it actually means. I'll tell you something else. A lot of people don't understand what equity based uh, learning means. You know, the words equity and equality have gotten all confused. Um, I, when I say that I want equal, I want every student to have equal opportunities in a classroom. Now I'm automatically labeled a racist, okay? I am not saying that there's a lot of schools in minority communities that need serious help. I just think I have a better idea of how to help them. I chose to teach in Title I schools because I recognize that they need better teachers. And I was a damn good teacher. You know, I, they need better teachers. So we need to be spending our money more wisely. And all of these layers of bureaucracy just sucks up the money. Our kids need an equal opportunity. Every child should be going to a school that has excellent teachers. Every child should have, you know, excellent lessons that their teachers are teaching. Forget about equity. Equity stifles uh, aspirations for greatness, okay? If everybody's gonna end up in the same spot, then why be great? Why strive to be great? We don't forget about equity. We need, every student needs an equal opportunity in the classroom. So. People on school boards, people on city councils, all the way up to, I think, the unprecedented Biden do not understand what they're even talking about. They just have these buzzwords, you know, critical race theory, cultural race theory, equity based learning. And they're pushing that and they don't even know what it means. Right. I mean, look, when you take away the motivation, um, everybody wilts. I mean, we know that 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 is uh, very cruel. I mean, what we've always said is. In, and I had an interview today actually with a very progressive uh, reporter. And I said, look, people of all stripes know that this is anti-intellectual. And the one thing that makes equity happen is learning. Everyone has an equal opportunity to learn. When you throw in SEL, which is social emotional learning, when you throw in critical race theory, anti-racist training, culturally responsive teaching, and when you come out with is a bunch of students who are uneducated. And it's particularly bad for children that are already on the low rung of the socioeconomic rings. They fare the worst by this. They don't have the money to go to a private school or for tutors or for any of these other things. And it is demonstrably unfair to them because look, this is equal, Rook, in that it strips every child of an opportunity for a class A education. It strips everybody. So the ones that are going to hurt the worst are the ones who are already suffering the most. Nancy, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, from what I've seen with a lot of this uh, quote unquote diversity literature, or at least modern day, you know, and I'm not talking about, the, you know, classics like Zora Neale Hurston and, you yeah. know, that type of uh, literature. I'm talking about like the modern day children's books um, about, um, you know, black and white and police and, you know, that diversity book I found through the SEL training, the social emotional learning training on the um, DPI website. Uh, a lot of that is not, um, it's propaganda based. It's not for children. You can just see it just in the words they use. Like you think about the, the children's books from our, our youth, and I'm you know thinking of Dr. Seuss, of course, but the language is just boppity and all over and the kid gets drawn in just from the rhymes and the silly it's political nonsense. It, it, and these um, fantastic illustrations that are goofy and weird and and creative and inspiring. And now these days, the, the books are very literal. Like, you know, it's a literal picture of this person and literal words. You know, the one that got me interested in all of this um, that I first started my journey, I was found finding the book um, This Day in June um, that was read to my daughter, which was 
in in first grade that was a literal gay pride parade um, with people kissing and rhymes like uh, wearing leather in nice weather or something. And it's, I mean, at least write like a scholarly fun yeah. <laughs> gay pride book if you're gonna put, I mean, this is not, this is not something that's gonna inspire a child to think creatively or, or think um, bigger or think they can do whatever they want. It's frightening, actually. Yeah, and I can say that, I mean, everyone's different, but, um, you know, going into medicine and then into surgery, it wasn't like I had to, I had to know that there were female surgeons for me to think that I could be successful. You know, I admired the male surgeons just as well, you know, as long as they were good at their job or, or looking at the way they taught or how they operated, it didn't matter to me if it was a woman or a man. What mattered to me was how inspiring they were. And it was actually a male who inspired me to go into surgery and was very inspiring. So this whole like identification, oh, you have to see yourself and all of that. I mean, I get that on a certain level, but come on, let's let's bring it back to reality, folks, and realize that it's the person inside and what they're capable of doing that we should admire, not necessarily their exterior. Right, and just bringing it back and putting it out. I mean, look, I, I from our reading of 324, um, this brings back and honors the, the memory and the great work of MLK. It is the, the content of character, not the color of skin. We want a colorblind, merit-based education system. And what has happened is since COVID and all this lockdown and all this confusion, um, we don't even recognize the North Carolina public education system anymore. Again, I mean, we're asking for that ISKME contract. We, we, we want it defunded. We, we want local control, local control, okay? of our school systems and we want parental involvement. Um, you know, the reality is public schools need to serve all children. And the best way to do that is to have everything open to have parents in the loop. Because when you when you have coercion, dishonesty, uh, opaqueness, what you have is distrust. And people want to know why are you all why are you asking the state this but why are you because the, the government is for transparency, privacy it's for the citizen. We have that completely flipped right now. We're trying to flip it back here. That's what we're trying to do. And we're starting from the state down. Look, the state of North Carolina, that DPI, it needs to be a buffer, a firewall between the federal government pushing down into North Carolina. We do not want Washington DC education system to run North Carolina. And that's what we're, we're working on. People need to understand everybody at the district level, Moms for Liberty, all the other moms groups we're working with across the street, and they know this, that if our group isn't helping to preserve that firewall, it won't make a damn bit of difference what you guys do at the district level. And that's, that's on the way. That's on the way, Brooke. So you see, they're yeah. already afraid. The school boards are already afraid to do things at the district level. You know, Hooper lifted the mask mandate and not that he ever really, I mean, it was just done under emergency powers. They're not laws, okay? They wouldn't stand. It, it, he didn't have the right to do that to us in the first place. But school boards are literally afraid to take, they don't, they don't have the courage to say that your kids don't have to wear masks in the fall. And it's all because basically Cooper hasn't said, yes, you can take the masks off. You know, it, it's, it's, we already have lost our power at the district level. We just have to take it back. We absolutely we have, to force, have to force, we have to force the local people, the local elected officials, whether it's the city council or whether it's the school board members, we have to force them to do it. And the only way that we can force them to do it is to show up in force yeah. and in numbers. We have to bombard them with emails. We have to call their phone numbers. We have to show up at the school board meetings. I mean, I, I'm fighting right now just to get, you know, people to claim their two minutes. Last school board meeting, I think there were four of us. And you know what? Those, the four of us that did it, we made a huge right job. Yeah, you did. 20 of us next time, 100 of us. I mean, I want another 100 standing outside if, yeah. it's, if it's a virtual meeting with, you know, signs. When can we come in person? Take the masks off. The only way we're going to get what we want is if we get off of our couches and stop complaining and do something proactive. Yeah. Well, that's, 
Right. We yeah, know. These, I'm sorry. Yeah. These these boards and these people and these um this network, you know, they thrive on secrecy and they thrive on kind of an elitism or academic, you know. St- well, I'm you know trained and whatever, and it's all BS. So what they're very scared of is is this type of thing where parents are willing to show what they're actually saying. I. You know, to get out of the argument of defining CRT, I just show pictures and tweets and say, well, this is a CRT theorist and this is what they're saying. They don't want to have white women as friends. So there you go. You're going to train your kid. Um, but yeah, the the key to this for them is to keep things secret and kind of under the radar, just like, you know, in um, in Eastern Bloc countries in Soviet, you know, when Gorbachev came out with the whole glasnost and perestroika concepts a lot of those other countries under um you know communist rule were very scared of that because they felt like as soon as you could have some open or slightly freer press it was going to come tumbling down and lo and behold you know eventually it did so i think the more people can talk about it the more inspired they are by other moms who are out there at school boards by people who are protesting and courage is contagious is uh, a colleague's a colleague of mine's favorite phrase and i love that phrase um, they see these videos, they get inspired. Um, they realize, hey, these these tweets and these these charts and these examples don't don't look so good. I'm going to go and stand out there and see what's going on. The the leftists yeah. don't want that to happen because they don't they want it to school under board. secrecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, we've gotten some comments uh, lately. You know that moms have been under fire for going to the school board, and a lot of folks. Well, not a lot of folks. A minority of folks think. Hey, well, moms should just be quiet and homeschool their kids in the discussion. No, I'm sorry. We are advocating for quality public education in this country. Look, this is our money. This is our country. I mean, taking the country back means starting at the school level, showing up. You're right, bro. Showing up is not the best. I mean it when people tell me that. They're like, well, if you're not happy, well, then just pull your kids out and homeschool them. Well, I have done that before, and I'm fully capable of doing that again. That's a cop out. My kids and your kids and everybody else's kids, they are entitled as Americans to a good, decent, adequate education. So I'm gonna fight for that. I'm gonna fight for it. I I can homeschool, but that shouldn't be the only option I have. If I'm not happy with what's happening inside my daughter's classroom, I should be able to say something about that without becoming a target. I should be able to question things. I should have open access to the school and to my daughter's classroom and to the materials that she's being taught. I mean, it used to be that way. Absolutely. If you have a hard time getting into your kid's classroom, then you better ask yourself why. Right. After I found that book, I was discouraged from ever from coming back. They wanted to punish me. Like I found that book. I asked some questions. They thought they answered my questions. I asked more questions. And then all of a sudden I was uninvited from reading hour or whatever. I mean, they really don't, they, they don't want you in there asking questions and challenging um, them. They back right down. Yeah. Now, but these schools are ours. These schools are ours. I mean, we've gotten a very hard time since we've been asking questions at the state level. We think because there's one hell of a lot of the budget in North Carolina that goes for education. I think it's 56% of the budget goes for education. So I'm learning that they really don't like it when you're snooping around and asking for questions. We want to know how the money is spent. We want to know why contracts are being renewed. We want to understand that when someone is saying that they don't support critical race theory and they're passing contracts that do, like the federal spending bill, which provides for $645,000 of critical race theory training, how can you be against critical race theory training, but the spending is going for that? So we've been asking a lot of questions, Nancy, right? We've been shaking a lot of trees. And just like Brooke, you're shaking trees down the district level. You know that you're getting the pushback and the what for. We're shaking trees at the, the state level and asking them about federal and state spending. And so the bottom line here is the more of us that can do this, the more of us can band together and present the facts and ask questions and kind of demand results. I mean, the only reason why we sent these people to work for us in the state house is to work for us and represent our interests. They need to protect your job. Yes, do your job and stop messing with other people's children. Hmm. And yeah, exactly. 
it's about being a voice for the voiceless, right? Because there's a lot of powerful people that they want to say, hey, we're fighting racism. Hey, we're doing that. I mean, if you are and you're doing it in good faith, that's a valiant goal. I just haven't seen the evidence that that's happening. Look, there is no doubt that the scores for black and brown students are way below where they need to be. And that is a problem and that needs to be fixed. That needs a spotlight on it. But the solution isn't training people with, let me put this up again so everyone can see. How is, and explain this to me, how is training teachers to give up their position to others and to hang around with friends that don't look like them uh, and to sit with your discomfort? How are these things helping black and brown children learn and recover their learning losses? You know, the very same people that told us, hey, don't use uh, race when you're talking about learning losses from the pandemic. Don't bring that up. The same people when we were trying to fight for black and brown students, the same people that said, how dare you are, are now telling us that this, what you're looking at on the screen is a way to help black and brown families to recover from learning loss. This is a bogus scam. Yeah, I think you have to fight on every level wherever you're comfortable. And definitely the local level, we definitely need people in the school boards um, that are you know, willing to stand up for what they believe in and won't be intimidated um, with a lot of adequate support around them. And we also need to start talking to some of the more centrist or even left of center people who don't agree with this too, find them, talk to them, figure out ways we can expand um, with their help as well and to start push back and to realize that this is really uh, this isn't you know i hate i don't like i understand the political thing but and there's certainly certain political parties i trust more than others but this is an everyday person this yeah. is a populist type of thing this it's is a common, that, common sense issue yeah. that it should, it should be is, and this divisive stuff where there's no proof that it works i mean i'd love to see the statistics we're showing that inserting this stuff betters reading scores and all of that um, that makes teachers miserable, that um, causes people of different races to be suspicious of each other. Um, I'd like to see proof where that works. And I think this should be a common sense issue that um, anyone who wants a good education for their kid could get on board with. I think yeah. we're starting to see that. I think we're starting to see classic liberals and Democrats, and it's beginning to become a nonpartisan issue and you're starting to see, um, because the poisonous nature of it is really starting to come to light. And so um, it should be a nonpartisan issue. And I think every day, the more that we fight and people become aware and understand what it really is, the more people come out of the woodwork and say, oh, wait a minute. I don't like that. I'm not for that. Right. That's right. And once they see, guys, I'm just going to put this up here again. Um, I have shown people this, and then I have followed that up with, this is a nonpartisan thing, because even people on the left who, in good faith, believe that the system is stacked against students of color, um, when they look at this, they're, they're saying, hey, the, these arrows right here, they don't just apply to white people. They can apply to any color. In other words, if you truly believe the system is systemically corrupt, then you would never want to give the system this kind of power that you see right, right here. So well, we're, gonna, we're going to end with this, but um, thank you guys for being on. And I think that we need to um, know where we stand with this bill. Um, can we link that chart? Um, Lily, we have it on our website. I, let me tell you where this chart came from. I believe this is from the SPLC's, is it called Teaching Tolerance? Yeah, now it's renamed for Learning Learning for Justice. It's a very corrupt organization. It's very bad. A lot of these anti-racist groups, including we are, use it for curriculum, which again is another overt hypocrisy because the SPLC is rooted in a history of racism and sexism and taking people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, and learning for justice. I'm going to get this up here. Um, but so we've got Schoolhouse Shop. Um, that's a part of our organization, and what it is is it's a 
a tip line that um, teachers have utilized, parents have utilized, um, people in the community, and have sent this. This actually came in from a tip um, that we verified. We don't just get the tips and say, hey, this came from, we actually verified it and attached it to a real incident. And this is, um, we found being given across the district. And so, um, and, and you know what, if you have people that are on the fence, don't beat them over the head with it. Just show them this schematic yeah. for justice and say, hey, look at these things. And can you, um, um, yes, Lily, we are in Florida. I'm going to, I'm going to get you mom. And by the way, Moms for Liberty is in Florida too. And I love our organization working together because it's sort of like a high and a low, right? We've got moms scattered everywhere. We're like their worst nightmare. Um, but um, we will, we'll talk to you about that um, offline, Lily. Just drop your email in here. Um, no, Lily, you're fine. Um, so, so yeah, I forgot what I was saying, but yeah, ha and by the way, the number one um, problem, the number one thing that as activists we struggle with before you do anything, you have absolutely have to have the facts first. When you're going in with your hair on fire to this school board meeting and say, oh my God, I just know there's critical race theory and you do not have evidence, yeah. you will not get far. So you have to look for evidence, evidence that looks like this. You'll have to show people, look, you can tell people or show them. You're going to have to show and not tell. You show them the evidence of this, and then you just ask them, hey, how are these things helping improve our STEM scores? And then and then you can get to a point where you're going to be able to have discussions with people on the right and the left side of the aisle, right? And, and then that's where really where we need to get with this. We need to really um, start bridging our, our differences and all come together for, for kids. So with that, we're, we're going to end this. Thank you guys, um, because Nancy is going to turn dark. Brooke, it's going to turn dark where you are, and you don't have any lights <laughs> with, in your house. So we we have to, before the sun goes down, we have to wrap this up. So thank you guys um, very much for tonight. And again, just share these articles. Read, read, read. Research on your own. Let me get a little plug real quick. We are national. We're um, expanding also. There are three chapters right now in North Carolina. We have one in Mecklenburg, mine. We have one in Union County, and we have one in Iredale. We have another one in the works. And my personal goal is to have one um, in every county before the 2022 election. So reach out to me. I'm on Facebook, all over the place. If you want to get a chapter started in North Carolina, I will help you. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, guys. Have a great evening. And I think we may adjourn uh, later this week. Bye, guys.